Welcome to Making Sense Online, a podcast-ish thing with the delightful Dave Cormier uh, and myself. So also Dave, delightful. How has your week been? Uh, it's been a fascinating week, actually. The the big challenge is we're running our first uh, online course to teach people to teach online, um, and that's something that I've had a chance to do in a number of different circumstances before, but it's always been in a coalition of the willing. Yeah, um, yeah, which is not necessarily the situation we're confronting right now. That's that's not to cast any shade on the people who are there. That just this is not something they had planned to do. Right. So I have a lot of people who are serious educators, whatever else. But I've always, always, always said that you wanted to introduce people to online learning in a face-to-face -face classroom. Yeah. Because there are so many little details that are hard to get across the first time, and so uh, it's been a really interesting challenge. Um, I, interesting. I can't... I can imagine, and I saw you did a you did a nice post on that. You might want to drop it randomly in the chat so we can grab it for later sure. for the recording. But uh, you did a nice post where you sort of really solidly laid out the process that you're looking at this, and you're at a different place now. It's funny over the last three to four weeks. You know, the early stage was panic, and you're starting to see some planning starting to come in. Exactly. Where and, and part of it, I think, is the inevitability that we're not going back to normal. In, well, this is it. Right. There's, I, I've seen a couple of articles this week of universities that are saying, look, we're just cutting our fall term. Others saying, you know what, we may end up cutting our next term as well, right? Uh, yep. Into January because there's so much uncertainty in this. So there's absolutely no sense of clarity on what this kind of yeah, stuff is. Yeah, there's another article I was just reading a couple yeah. of minutes ago about faculty who are suggesting to students that they know to not go, uh, to, to high school students they know not to go to school in the fall because they really right. don't want to be involved in this process. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. And I think, think that's that? one of those things. What do I think of that? Yeah. I mean, um, I think that the first year experience uh, is what it is. I think we have a lot of customs about what you should do that most of it involves drinking and, and not necessarily studying. I don't think the first year experience has traditionally been uh, as good as it could have been in higher ed. So I think the increased focus on what education is actually for could make it a better year um, for some people, I think. I feel so like- Let's say you, you know, it's different, different parts of the world obviously have different rituals and rites of passage. The U.S. one is very pronounced because it is a coming of age experience that I don't think I've seen in any other country. It's really a, a marked transition into adulthood. If you had, it's even in a Canadian context, which is less pronounced, it's not that same kind of sharp ridge, move away from home, live on your own, live in a dorm norm that you see uh, in the U.S. context. But if you Or had, the belonging to the sports teams and all the rest of that yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. Like the, we're the Badgers kind of stuff. Right. So let's talk about you. You've got an 18-year-old daughter. She's going yeah. graduating high school this year. What would you tell her? Go to university or take a year and do something. What would be your advice? Well, it's funny because, as you know, I, I spent five or six years working in uh, transitions with students coming into first year student uh, recruitment, but also retention and uh, student orientation, new student orientation. Um, m my answer is always the same to everybody. It totally depends on what the kid is like. So I don't know that my, my, my advice would be any different this year than it would be any other year, except that this is not the year to take your gap year. Um, right? So <laughs> yeah, you're, not, you're not traveling. My advice is basically the opposite of what is in that article, which is this is a really good year. If you can find a place that's going to do online learning well, this is a really good year to get your feet under you because you're not going to be stuck inside the distractions inside of a dorm room. You're not going to be involved in that kind of process. You're going to get a chance to sit home and you're going to have nothing else to do but to get your homework done. So I would say that now is a really great time for people to commit to that process. If you can have first year students who are getting accustomed to the rhyme and rhythm of being a little bit more under, yeah. a little bit more empowered, that now's a really good time to start doing that. That's what I would say. I mean, if kids aren't ready, kids aren't ready, you can't make it. Okay, let's, let's look at you. Dave Cormier is now 18. Yes. And what he really wants in his first year out of high school is to spend a year learning online. Like, do you think you would have? Yeah, I think I would wanted to have learned online. I, I like many students, one of the reasons why I got into first year advisement when I was inside of the university space is I was one of these kids who had no idea why I was going to university. Um, I didn't know why I was going, I didn't have any real clear idea. I decided what I wanted to do when I was 14 or 15, mostly to get adults to stop bothering me. Um, and hadn't really put the time in to figure it out, first in family, well not quite first in family, so my siblings went first. Um, but there was no real idea of why I was going to university. 
I failed out of university my first two years uh, because I didn't go to class because I had no real investment into the process. Um, so for someone I think like that, that if, online yeah. learning would have made it worse. Like if, no. if that was you, you don't think, I don't think so. Why do you think that? Because you're stuck in your house you have nothing else to do. The amount of focus we're getting from people right now is really kind of amazing, right? So you look at the, look at the seminar that Cheresky and Alec Kuros put together in Saskatchewan a couple of days ago. So Saskatchewan, province in Canada, um, I don't know, what's the population of Saskatchewan? 1.5 million? I think million? Uh, 35 people last I checked. There's not, it's not a gigantic uh, province in terms of population. It's a couple of big cities, but that's about it. Um, and they sent out a call and three days later had 500 teachers show up to learn how to do online learning inside of their classrooms. But that's teachers. Like, I'm like, trying to get at, I'm trying to get at these kids who... I know what you're saying, but those teachers, you would have gotten 10, right? The, the overall message that I'm trying to say here is that people are home with nothing to do. And if I was forced to be home instead of out partying till five o'clock in the morning, which is what I was doing my first two years at university, I think inevitably I would have done some of that work. <laughs> yeah, or, or you would have read all of Reddit and many of the ridiculous sites on the internet and played a lot but of you're going to do that anyway. I guess what I'm trying to say is there, there's nothing intrinsically motivating about online learning for an 18 year old. And one of the articles that I've seen come up or concepts in a number of articles that, that have been raised recently is students who are, and, and I want to shift to the financial dimension today. If we yep. can a little more on that. For sure. The picture is not clear yet, but it's getting much clearer than it was even a few weeks ago. And I will say it's unequivocally going to be, carnage yeah. but we're seeing students now are coming out and saying look i didn't sign up to be online you're charging me and again some of this, these are u.s stories you are charging me 20 30 40 50 thousand dollars a year i'm not willing to pay that so you're starting to see class action lawsuits being brought against universities you have faculty you know 20 year uh, faculty the article that you referenced earlier that are saying nah don't bother take this year out you have international students, UK, had a, or the university sector in UK this week said, we're expecting an 80 to 100% decline in international students. Now, few regions of the world are more exposed to international students than Australia and New Zealand. In many cases, that's a 30 to 40% of their entire budget comes from yep. the international population. So, the so shifting from this idea of will students learn online versus will they play? I mean, there's a doubt there's, you know, play games and do whatever else. There's no doubt some that will study. Those are yep. not necessarily going to be the norm. I think the vast majority are going to figure out how zoom bombing works and uh, you know, spend a lot of time social networking, but let's talk finances now, if you're okay with that shift. Yeah, man. All right. So here's what I've seen over the last week for articles. Australia is getting slaughtered and yeah. the numbers are almost incomprehensible in terms of what's going on there. Um, the, there's an, you know, uh, our good friend Alex Usher posted yeah. an article today that looked at exactly this concept and his argument was there are an incredible amount of people who are unaware of what's coming. So you have, for example, in Canada, we have a reasonably uh, sort of provincial based model. Generally budgets are set so far, there isn't a huge impact. So he says, you know, Canada so far is gonna be okay, but a few years down the road, it'll be uh, a little different. I'm worried about the US. They're gonna get hit before the fall semester with state budget pullbacks. Things that had been allocated until now will be retreat, retracted. Uh, the uh, in other parts like Australia, you're already seeing UNSW saying five six hundred million dollar yep. potential deficit. Sydney in a similar range, and any of the group of eight in Australia are talking in this language, which is nothing short of catastrophic. So if you start to see these kinds of things emerging, and Alex does a great job saying, look, here is the UK and the Canadian context, which are comparable. They're reasonably stable. There yeah. is the Australia, New Zealand one. They're facing enormous challenges. The federal government, because it's a federally funded system largely, has stepped up a bit to say, we'll cover some of it, at least your domestic students drop. Then you've got the US, which is going to get hit early and get hit harder because they are localized institutions that rely heavily on federal funding and they're going to see enormous drop offs. What are you seeing from a financial end or what are some of your thoughts when you see student lawsuits, requests for delaying access to university, 
these huge budget deficits and the fact that we still have no idea what's really happening with the economy and we have zero idea how it's going to move forward. I'll just fix all that for you, George. It's no problem. Um, hey, you don't need to fix it. You just need to. I think. I think. I think it's. I think it's, I think it's interesting this. that that we were not prepared for this coming in. So we have not made. We have not established um, a raison d'être for university in the modern discourse, right? So we've got this idea that people are going to university. We've been selling the idea we're going to universities to get jobs for less than or fifteen years. Right, we moved away from its sort of you're lucky to get here kind of university model. Whereas in the public discourse now, a lot of universities are saying you're coming here, you're gonna get jobs, you're gonna prepare you for the future, future jobs narrative, all this stuff, right? Which puts us in a really bad place right now. Because one, that was never really true. Our universities aren't designed to do that. Our faculty have not made that adjustment. Um, and again, it's an adjustment. It's not what they signed up for. So like, I understand why they're reacting that way. But when you talk to faculty and I have talked to people all over and, and people at other institutions in this process, when they talk to faculty about moving online, they go, well, that's not what I do. Or when they try to go online, they're like, okay, but I'll just throw my PowerPoints up there because that's my job, right? That's, I'm not here to actually do student support. I'm here to filter students out, right? I'm here to make sure that only the strong survive. Um, which is not the model that the universities themselves have been selling. So we've got this, this central disconnect at the core of higher ed, in my perspective, right now, right? Uh, I had a great conversation today with uh, Robin DeRosa and Martha Burtis, who were talking about how we need to go back to the mission of the university, right? And that needs to be what we're doing. But I don't think there's any coherent response there. So that when we go talk to governments about what we do, I don't think we have a coherent message for what that is unless people believe what I think you believe, which is that university is a core institution inside of our culture and that without it, we lose a, like a core institution, a core uh, pillar of Western democracy. Yes. Well, Western democracy, but so-called Western democracy. Not even, right? but even more than that, like let's like, so first of all, I just want to interrupt there, but, but it's not even just Western democracy. It is the capability for people to live quality and meaningful lives in relation to sort of some global community that we're all a part of. I think universities provide an entrance way to that. Universities are amongst the most diverse institutions of society, the most international institutions that we see in society. So I have enormous love for universities and an enormous desire to see them preserved. Yeah, but, but I don't think that that message is clear I don't think we have a coherent way of pitching that right now. Right. Right. I don't think that's that, one of the reasons why, you know, your Udacities and Coursera's and others have taken such a strong lead in the, in the reskilling job market preparation angle, because I, I think that's going to be an issue. If, if, if I was now unemployed and typically when unemployment hits, we see a bit of a rise in student population because yeah. they're trying to reskill. I don't know if I go to a university. I think I would I would give some serious thought to doing a Coursera to edX pathway into university in an in-demand field like data science or computer science or something related. Maybe, but I mean, that's not an easy thing to just set up and do, right? There are people who are disposed towards that kind of approach. So there's only so many of those fields that are actually that actually put you in a position to do it. I mean, when you look at expanding fields right now in the world, we're looking at groceries, was it, we said earlier, it's grocery store clerks of people who work at Amazon. Um, th that's the, the field that's growing right now. Whereas if I was gonna plan out my future, do I plan it for the next six to 12 months or do I plan it for the next six to 12 years? That's always been the distinction between the community college approach and the university approach inside of our cultures. Also, the other thing that I think is missing out of that argument is in the US, again, to make the distinction between the US and Canada, in the US, when you go to a university, you also, you also accrue allies. Right. So like if you're a badger and you go and apply somewhere and they find out you went to that university, that means something. You got a better chance to be hired. Yeah. That's a thing. That's not a thing in Canada. No, right? it's a, it's a, maybe a conversation. Like I have no idea it's which university you graduated from. I think yeah, I, have, I have no idea. Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. yeah. I know which one I graduated. I don't know where you graduated from. See, and that's the thing because in the U S it's, it's three conversations in and you know, their affiliation. I did a talk a number of years ago at uh, university of Michigan and they, they gave me a, um, you know, sweatshirt. 
And when I go for a walk in, when I'm in Dallas or Arlington more precisely, but the DFW area, I'll go for a walk on a cooler day and I'll wear the, the Michigan uh, hoodie. And there is no outfit that I wear that gets more acknowledgements and more go yeah. blue than that does. So the identity yeah. affiliation in the U.S. is interesting. So that's why I find the, the development of this ecosystem that competes with universities for labor market and job skills training interesting because clearly they're gaining numbers. They're gaining people in, in those kinds of environments and they're still feeding off or perhaps more politely feeding into the university system because a lot of the masters in public health in data science and computer science start in edX or Coursera but then roll into a full master's degree from those partner institutions. Interesting. So a lot of the stuff when you look at the growth market that that's holding it's just I've been thinking since you sort of laid out the 47 factors here so much of the growth factor in the Canadian market has been nursing, engineering. They've all been community college, like I should say community college, but more college style programs. Far more like what you see in a designer college program. Also that far more residential, right? That require you to be on site. It is tough to learn how to put a needle in a vein when you don't actually have access to something that you can physically touch. Yeah, It's the same thing with the engineers. I'm having conversations with engineers about how to do how to learn how to use a cooling motor or whatever they I was described to me. I didn't understand it. Uh, I'll suffice it to say that flux I did capacitor. To, flux capacitor. Exactly. So a lot of the financial underpinning of the, the sort of resetting that's happened in higher ed that's connected to that workforce preparation this has been connected to programs that are particularly residential, um, which again, is going to take a hit through, through the next six to 12 months. And I don't know how many universities are going to be able to recover. So I've seen uh, some interesting things that, and again, I'm, I want the theme to be the financial dimension today a little bit, but I'm happy to go wherever you want to take it. Mm, oh, that's fine. Um, there was a, a gentleman, Stephen Witte, who uh, posted recently online about his experience as an adjunct. And so he says this university that he was teaching at, he's got these three hour classes that are partially, you know, discussion based and uh, partially they're viewing sort of asynchronous uh, videos and so on. So the university in this case said, well, because you're only teaching and by teaching, we're talking lecturing half yeah. of the time, we're going to cut your pay in half because you're not teaching. So it's, this is the kind of mindsets that we're coming up against that you see when systems are in transition, which means the metrics that existed in the previous system, I'm paying you to lecture, yeah. don't carry over into a system that now requires group-based learning or peer-based learning because listening to a lecture online for three hours a day is incredibly fatiguing and not necessarily a great learning tool. One of the things that we shared as I think it was listed as an optional reading this week was a Dunlosky article that looked at what actually matters like based on a series of meta reviews what matters when people end up studying and what actually produces significant learning gains. And it's very clear that lecturing isn't top of the list. So you want students to be more active and more engaged. And yet when people do try to transition to active pedagogical approaches, the system doesn't acknowledge what that looks like and can't reward it. And you have a few seemingly dense administrators that say, oh, you know, you only lectured for an hour and a half. So here's half of your pay. Uh, I've been in that conversation several times this week. Yeah. Uh, and we have wandered away from, uh, from finance specifically, but that's okay. Where, um, part of the design of the course that I'm doing is to try to give people an experience of what it's like to learn online. A lot of them have never taken an online course. So the very first thing that happens is a three hour lecture. Now it's collaborative and there are breakout groups and the rest of this stuff. But at the end of the day, they spend three hours online. And at the start of this three hour session, it was like, oh, well, I have to teach for three hours. That's what it says in my contract. And I introduced the concept of the asynchronous course hour and everybody's like, Pff, not everybody, but the people who were, were dismissive until they got to the end of three hours and realized what it's like to be on the other end of the microphone for three hours. And suddenly people were, were willing to engage in that conversation in a different way because it's exhausting. Yeah. Because I asked them like how many people could would generally describe themselves as exhausted right now? And the answer was an awful lot of them. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and so they were talking about this, this idea, which to me is core to the institutional model between the Carnegie unit and the asynchronous course hour, there are the hidden conversations that live underneath this transition to online that we're in the middle of right now. When you say Carnegie units, some people nod their heads and go, oh my God, he's talking about it again. But that's the idea that we go from, 
you have 15 hours inside of class and 45 hours outside of class, one to three model, that's how university is structured. That's why we're different from the college experience where people have the Canadian version of the college experience. People have 40, 45 hours face-to-face -face in classrooms and it's apparently supposed to be an equivalent model. And with the asynchronous course hours, suddenly we're saying, oh, well, if it's not 15 hours of lecture, how do we translate that to an online space? Well, it's a discussion forum. Oh, discussion forums, part of the 45, not part of the 15. How do you replace the 50? That's, that's the argument in a nutshell. I, again, I don't think we're prepared to have that conversation. The biggest thing that I've seen happen in the last four weeks is the exposure of all the discussions we never bothered to have about yeah. what university is. Well, and, and in the middle of a crisis, self-actualization is perhaps not the most but, you know, prudent use of time, but you know, you're raising a, a valid point though. And, and I think my, my, the reason I, I brought this up was it is a financial question because universities are making decisions based on how to recover their budget, for example. Mm -hmm. So there was a recent uh, article that about Harvard and Harvard decided that they were going to put in hiring freezes. And this isn't unusual. I've seen many universities that have initiated a hiring freeze. Uh, I've seen a few that have started to do this token uh, significant pay cut. So in this case, it was the university president and top leaders at Harvard saying they're going to take a 25% pay cut, which, I mean, it's more a signal, if you will. But still, that's, that's not an insignificant development. And then you have an example uh, recently, uh, the OU president, um, uh, Joseph Heroz ended up saying, look, we're facing a very different kind of a future and we need to start recognizing that we're going to see uh, furloughs, we're going to see job losses, we're going to see, uh, you know, the, the shift to online classes continuing into 2021 and so on. Yeah. So we're now seeing early stages in the U.S. at least of state clawbacks of previously committed funds. And we're starting to see universities raising the conversation that furloughs and layoffs at a broad scale are coming. I think this is going to wash over the system the same way that news of COVID did. And what I mean with that is first we had a few things, oh, COVID's happening in China. We're not doing much about it, but we're slowly getting sensitized to it. Oh, there's a couple of cases in Canada, a couple of cases in the US. We get sensitized. All of a sudden, one day somebody says, oh, you know, we can't do this anymore, right? We're going to shut down major public events. We all go around our lives. This one little thing is removed. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, now we're going to shut down non-essential services. Okay, we keep going. And all of a sudden now it's your stay-at-home order. So what I'm trying to get at is universities are softening the soil for the inevitable layoffs and program closures that are going to be coming, but we're going to see them roll out sort of one press release at a time and one press release at a time. It's not going to be, I mean, the Alaska model from last year is an example I've referenced before, where you suddenly have the state say, you got 40% cut. I think we're going to see over the next few months, the soil, if you will, slowly being fertilized with this, you've got a 40% cut coming. And I mean, that which wraps us all the way back to the first conversation here, which is what's the do you want your kid to be going to high school to go to university this year? Because if suddenly, I mean, it's one thing to pay like we do in Canada, six or $7,000 a year and the Brits it's nine or 10,000 pounds. But if you're paying $50,000 a year to go to a school on the expectation that you are trying to get into med school from my experience, at least that whole trip to med school business has led to increasing litigation from parents towards their, their kids' grades. Right now, those pathways, the professional pathways, are not being done online. People are not going to online school to get their way into medical school. Mostly, generally speaking, not the way that's happening. Suddenly, those people whose parents have the money to sue the universities are going to be in online programs, and their litigation is going to go through the roof, right? Like, so there's all these sort of trickling knock-on factors that happen as soon as you start to cut down the, as soon as you break the structure of the university, it only works as it is because it kind of grew up organically and it's kind of set up there. But once you start taking giant chunks of it away, everything else starts to peter down around it. That's, that's where like litigation alone to me in the next year is going to be amazing because if I'm taking an online course and I got an 82 or a 94 and that 94 is not high enough, 
it's just going to be filed and filed and filed and filed because there is while in a face-to-face -face classroom you can create a rubric that's ridiculous but then will allow you to be quote unquote fair right i don't think you can do that online at all well and and if you like you said if you fail so to speak online you uh you have a perfect foil or perfect excuse for why and yeah. uh and no doubt it will be taken up and in some cases very fairly yeah. so no, students, I agree. We, we we know that and it's something that justin reich mentioned in the interview we did in week one in this course but we know that and the research is clear that people from an underrepresented uh, population or background pay a price for moving into digital environments there are uh, gains that the university enables and support structures that have been created to diversify the student population that just don't exist when you when you work and you transition online so online rewards a certain kind of a student profile that likely is already motivated towards success or has a good scaffold structure around them that enables success i for instance did, did not know that international students in the city i live in can't get an isp account yeah. So all of the, there's all these little trickle down pieces that nobody had planned for. We don't have systems in place for uh, each individual item. You can imagine some kind of way to, to fix it. But the problem is, is there's going to be hundreds of them and we're only going to find them after they start. Right. So yeah. it's going to be like to, to, to go back to the COVID example. First of all, there's no toilet paper. Right. And then there are no razors and then there's no hair dye and then there's no, and then there's no, and then there's no. And by the time you get far enough down the road, it's too late to fix the system behind it that's gonna be able to do it. So for instance, in, in our country, we've had a couple of, I would say almost incidental laws passed in the last three or four years that have saved our food security. And that's because the federal government has decided not to allow, to maintain independence and food security and not allow it to come across in the United States, which they were vilified for at the time, but now all of a sudden we're like, oh, that's probably good. Um, It'll be interesting to see post COVID the, I think there, the, the, there's going to be a lot of return to local kind of activities. I'm not sure if it'll yeah. be sustained or if it'll be a short blur, but uh, you already have Japan tying their uh, bailout partly to returning manufacturing to Japan. Uh, yeah, you have the U S recognizing that 90 some percent of their medical system is directly vulnerable to conflict with China, which mm -hmm. means in theory, they, they should conceivably want to start to pull some of those things back locally. Now, the in the US, it's the DACA students that are yep. currently in this limbo space where yes, sure. there's dollars now partially being allocated federally for higher education, but are any of those dollars available to in many cases the most vulnerable students that are attending the university? You know, the 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 uh, Students that moved here at a very young age have lived here their entire life probably don't even speak the language of the community where they may have been born to and brought here, you know, to the U.S. as a toddler. So that's, I think, what you, you're referring to when there are weird things oh, in the system pieces. that you don't recognize until yep. the system grinds to a halt and you try to restart it or start it in different ways. And you find all of the biases, the unfairness, the inequities grinding out the most vulnerable people. So uh, just to finish up here, I'm going to ask you a straight up financial question, not a perfect online system, but the online learning system we're likely to get in the fall. You have an 18 year old daughter. She, is the education she's going to get worth the same $5,000 a course face to face as it is online? Is it the same value for education? Yes, I think it is the same value. I don't think it's $5,000 though. I think the $5,000 model is not about learning. It's about cultural experience and systemic support and, the, and signaling value and so on. But I would pay the same for online as I would for in classroom. Now, if I was a parent in the US, I don't know if I would send my children to university this fall. In Canada, where tuition is still functional? Yeah, I would. Mm. Australia? Yeah, I would. UK? Sure. Yeah, I would. But it's just so out of sorts in the US, right? Like, so you as you know, when your kids get to university, you're going to have, uh, you know, you're going to drop, say, $5,000 a semester, probably on the high end for them to go yep. to university. And let's say they live at home with you because you're living in a you know, sort of large metropolis or large ish metropolis. You can afford that. They can live with you, you can drop their tuition, you could probably just do it with 
you know, a little bit of planning in advance uh, in terms of savings and away you go. If you're in the US though, where you're dropping 30, 40, 50,000, no, I wouldn't send, nobody should pay 50, $60,000 a year to learn online. They shouldn't pay it in a classroom, but that's the US model. Other parts of the world, like I said, I'd be happy sending because I think the online experience and the research bears this out is comparable to the in-classroom experience in terms of learning, not clear that all the other stuff like character with development and all those other yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. All right. Anyway, any final thoughts, Dave, before we wrap up? I think everything's going to be great, George. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's, you know, that's exactly what the world needs to hear. So, all right, Dave, good to chat. Hope you have a good Pleasure week. chatting as always, buddy. You bet. Bye.